This program is made possible through generous donations from viewers like you. To pledge your support, please visit arootawakening.tv slash give. Thank you. We are nearing the time to blow the shofar, or as it is sometimes called in the Bible, the trumpet. The Day of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, is just one week away. This day commemorates when Yehovah shouted down the Ten Commandments, the Torah, on Mount Sinai, and prophesies when Yeshua, the living Torah, will return. Something unique to the Day of Trumpets is that it is the only feast that starts on a new moon. So technically we know approximately what day it will be, but not exactly, because the new moon has to be sighted before the feast can begin. It's the day that Yeshua referred to when he said that no man knows the day or the hour, yet we are to know the season. And that means the season we are in right now is one of preparation. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to get right with people we have wronged and get right with Yehovah, both for the sake of the feast and to prepare for Yeshua's return. As far as timing goes, however, one thing is certain. It's the end of the sixth day. The sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live! Michael, it's going to be a great show tonight. It will be. Stand by studio, 30 seconds. Shabbat Night Live. We are one week away from Yom Teruah, and we're hosting it right here in this studio. It all starts next weekend with Shabbat Night Live and continues all weekend long. Michael Rood will be here, of course. Bill Cloud will be here, and our special guest will also be here. He's an author, a speaker, and someone who's seen the other side of religion, if you know what I mean. It'll be very interesting and lightning stuff. Our studio audience is sold out, but you can still watch it online. You can get all the details at yomterua.com. In fact, uh, that's why Michael isn't here uh, this evening. He is preparing for next week's event. So for tonight, you and I get to visit with my co-host, the Director of Ministry Development for the Root Awakening International. Please welcome Annie Reed. Hi, Hello. Annie. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good. I'm, I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Yom Teru is coming and it's crunch time. I know. So, yeah. you know, not only here, but in our house. I mean, what's your house like? Oh, my goodness. You don't want to know. It's, <laughs> it's all over the place. You know, my husband owns a business and it's really mm -hmm. difficult for us to get away for the coat. But even not going away is busy in the mm. house. So I can only imagine for those that are packing up right now and taking your families out to go camping, how how your schedule must look. Yeah, so. you know, that's funny that uh, Michael often mentions to us, you know, he spends a lot of time in Israel. He comes back here, shakes his head and says, I don't know what is it about this North Americans and camping on Sukkot. That doesn't happen in Israel. Everybody's in a sukkah. What's with this going to a campground business? So, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, it's, you know, some people feel like they have to, I guess, but... Everybody's a little bit different. But wherever you're spending Sukkot, we hope that you'll be able to join us for Yom Trua. Absolutely. Time is getting short to sign up to watch it online. We'd love to have you as a guest. Um, it's yomtruacharlotte.com, and you can see we have two different packages available for those that are viewing online. Um, and we just wanted to give you the best possible opportunity to right. grow and learn during this event because it will be a life-changing event. Mm -hmm. It's a life-changing feast. Yes, we're, we're going to be getting some very interesting information from all three speakers, very different messages from all three. So uh, not not conflicting, but just different aspects of, of what they're talking about. So uh, it's going to be very interesting. And like Andy mentioned, there are, there are two ways to... Um, to sign up for this. There's, uh, you can sign up for one package and you can just uh, see everything and download it after it's done, or you can uh, see it, download it after it's done, and you can get the DVD package as well. Uh, that's what this is all about. There's nothing in here yet, but this is what it will look like. So uh, you can see that at yomteruah.com. Now, um, October 1st, 
we are launching the premiere of the Chronological Gospels television show. Can you believe it? I cannot believe it. First, finally, yeah. and then second, that I'm just, I'm ecstatic. I am too, yeah. I, I've seen some of what it looks like, so I can tell you right now, you will not want to miss it. Oh, that's fabulous. I mean, we had all kinds of footage from Israel, and they even had a drone. We took a drone to Israel and f have some of those over, over uh, the head shots, and uh, Michael's driving a Jeep through uh, <laughs> through, the, through the desert and very uh, Indiana Jones meets the an archaeologist meets you know yeah. Michael Rood. <laughs> yep. And so this is great because if people prefer to learn by watching, this is where Michael takes you through the seventy weeks of Yeshua's ministry and will open your eyes to things you have never seen in the Bible before. I mean, you've probably read it through a thousand times, and so have they, and just never seen it the way he can explain it. I'm excited that we're on Sky Angel reaching the Christian world. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Our command is to go into all the world. And there's 7 billion people in the world right now. Uh, only half of them proclaim to be believers. So we have a big job to do. Yeah, and, and, and of those believers, I mean, there's a very small remnant. I mean, the Bible talks about that. There's always going to be the small remnant. It's not going to be everybody. So if you want to be in the know of what Yeshua is doing and, and what the truth is, um, the Chronological Gospels would definitely help you figure that out. It's on Dish Network. That's where you'll find Sky Angel, as yes. you mentioned. Uh, Sky Angel has uh, a couple of networks. One of them call, is called uh, Angel One. Correct. And, and that's, that's the one we're on. Mm -hmm. And that's on Dish Network Channel 262. Now, the first show will be uh, Saturday night, 7 p.m., the first Chronological Gospels. And uh, you can also watch it Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. You can also watch this show, Shabbat Night Live, on Dish Channel 262 starting in October. Uh, and that will be at 6 p.m. every Friday night. And um, in the past, when we've done television, the one show that most networks turned down was Shabbat Night Live. Hmm. This, this is kind of Michael's territory to share his opinion. No, no strings attached or no limits. Uh, but this network in particular was extremely excited about having uh, Shabbat Night Live on Sky Angel. So the world is changing. You yeah. know, people are searching for truth and they're ready to accept it. That's right. They're a little bit more open than they were before. Yeah, and that's that's great news. And and uh, all of these times we're talking about here are Eastern, by the way. So if you're on the West Coast, subtract three hours. And you know, if you're in Montana, you know what to do. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, also, we only have a few more weeks left for our Israel tour contest. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, that is is closing uh, at the end of October, I believe, is when mm -hmm. we're going to shut that down. So, uh, or, or maybe a little further, we don't know. But you need to get your story in. Uh, and because if you want to win a trip to Israel, like literally, yes, we said win a trip to Israel. I mean, this is this package is worth more than five thousand um, bucks. Tell us your story. That's all you have to do. Arudawakening.tv slash story. Tell us how you came to know the true Messiah, how you came to know Yeshua and, and what part maybe that a rude awakening was able to play in that. Uh, that's what we want to know. The best story is not necessarily the longest story, the shortest story. In fact, we want all stories to be between 500 and 750 words. So don't make it you know, extremely long. But just the most compelling story uh, is going to win. And we want to give back to you. We want right. to bless you. Michael right. wanted to bless you. I mean, that's, it was his idea. He said, no, let's, let's give him a trip to Israel. That's right. So. Yep. And he just, that was just, uh, I remember when he mentioned it. It was just mm -hmm. Shabbat Night Live. He mentioned it off the cuff. And we we're Okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. And, and he's, he, he also mentioned that, uh, you know, he's going to fly you in from wherever you live in the world. Mm -hmm. If you're from Europe, if you're from Africa, if you're watching from Russia, wherever, doesn't matter. He'll get you to Israel and back home. And, uh, and pay for the accommodations. And pay for the accommodations. Everything everybody else gets on the tour, you'll get too. Mm -hmm. So it, it's as simple as that. And, you know, the tour is all inclusive. All your meals, all your hotels, all the entrance fees to all the parks that you'll be going to. Uh, all that type of thing. Uh, of course, if you want to buy trinkets and, and that kind of thing, that's on your own, as it is with anybody. But uh, yeah, everything else is covered. Absolutely. And for those that want to go on the Israel tour, we do have a special running until the end of this month. You save $200 on your tour registration fee. Absolutely. Yep. And you can go to uh, rudetour.com. Uh, and you'll see all the details there. And if you register now, like Annie said, uh, between now and September 30th, which is next Friday, uh, then we will save you $200 in doing that. Now, uh, English transcription. We need folks to transcribe Michael's teachings into English before we can get them into other languages. We need some more help with that. We need some more folks uh, on our side, on our team. So if you can do that, please email us at transcription at michaelrood.tv. And um, 
we need to get to the calendar. Yes, We've we almost do. <laughs> forgotten about the calendar. So let's get to the calendar. Uh, here we are. We're almost at the end of the month. If you don't have a calendar, this is the most important time to have one. I mean, yeah. it's the feast days. This is, you know, this will tell us exactly when we are going to celebrate, when we're going to keep these days. Yeah, there it is right there on the next page. If we so. flip it over, you'll see all these days that are shaded. These are the high holy days. And uh, this is where, you know, my, uh, events in Yeshua's life are also noted in here in the Chronological Gospels. You can correlate the Chronological Gospels with the calendar. So, yes, very true. This is the time to have the calendar in your house, so make sure you get it. And uh, if you go to rootawakening.tv slash calendar, we can get you one of those. Um, we are a week away from the end of the sixth biblical, uh, from the end of the sixth biblical month, that is. We're in the sixth month, uh, known as Elul. And this is one of those rare uh, lulls in the action in Yeshua's life. Uh, usually we'd see an event marked on the calendar like we just noticed that correlates with the chronological gospels. Uh, last week was the anniversary of Yochanan's death, uh, John the Baptist, when uh, Herodias asked for his head on a platter because Yochanan challenged uh, you know, Herod's Ill illegitimate relationship with uh, Herodias, his brother's wife. Uh, and this week there's no specific event, but we are leading up to the most important uh, translational error in the gospel record. Uh, the disciples had uh, just returned from their summer assignments. Uh, that's in event number 98, if, if you're keeping track. And then Yochanan dies. And then before Yom Teruah is the feeding of the 5,000. Now, why is that so important? Well, Michael discovered early in his studies of the chronological gospels, that this is in fact how he was able to do it, is that he figured out this is the only miracle in the entire Bible that is recorded in all four gospel records. Now, what makes that significant from a timing perspective uh, is a translational edition uh, that messes up the whole timing of Yeshua's ministry. And, and that edition is John 6, 4. Um, Michael talks about this in, in extensively in the introduction to the Chronological Gospels, and I'm sure he'll mention it on the show as well, uh, which you can, uh, you can get the, uh, the Bible in audio form, format at uh, chronogospels.com, by the way. Uh, but the short version is that while setting the scene for the feeding of the 5,000, which happens, you know, next week, essentially, uh, translators added a verse to John's account that says Passover, Passover, yeah, Passover, a feast of the Jews was nigh. And that's John 6, 4 to be exact. Now, Michael has exposed this in addition to the text that does not, uh, as an addition rather, uh, to the text. It doesn't appear in two noteworthy ancient manuscripts. And you can see that reasoning on page 135 in the Chronological Gospels. But here's the thing. Even if you argue that, okay, maybe that verse does belong in the Bible. Let's just say for argument's sake, it's, it should be there. It's still a mistranslation. Because we're talking about Passover at Yom Teruah yeah. time. At summer, at the end of summer. Yeah, that makes no sense at all, does it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Michael says it doesn't belong at all. But even if you were to say, no, 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 it belongs in there. Well, you, you still have to say it's a translational error. And so this opens up the can of worms. Well, what else is a translational error? And this is why Michael's teachings are so great. Because he teaches you how to recognize these things. Um, and, and it just, it opens up your eyes. And, and the reason that it all matters is because it inserts a whole other year into Yeshua's ministry, if you consider that to be Passover, because the timing's all off. You know, it, it throws off everything if you're trying to understand the chronology of uh, prophecy and how Yeshua's ministry fulfills the Torah and all that. It just messes everything up. Because nobody really thinks about it. They think, oh, well, so it's a translation error. Big deal. Exactly. And they just kept on reading and then assuming right. that here's three and a half years. And then where it matters is where you get to those places where Yeshua is saying something on a very specific day because it correlates with something that is being celebrated or it's a tradition. And unless you know that, you're not going to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And then you're not going to realize that Yeshua is the fulfillment of every single prophecy as he said he would. Because if you don't line it up you know, with the culture of the times then uh, that statement isn't true. Mm -hmm. then, but if you do, then, then he does, he does uh, fulfill everything. Interesting stuff. So, you know. I, I mean, I, yeah, no, again, my seminary is a, a split off of the Worldwide Church of God mm. who taught that. But again, it, it, just, it didn't, like you said, it didn't connect the dots. And so, and that's what we're here to do is connect the dots for you. Right. That's that, and that's Michael's whole thrust. Exactly. That's why he, he is in ministry. And, uh, you know, he's been through uh, heart troubles and all the rest of it. He just powers through and gets better because he has a passion to share this ministry. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't, you know, before you know it, you, you've got an assumption that uh, th uh, of three and a half years of Yeshua's ministry that completely derails any understanding of how prophecy works 
and how Yeshua fulfilled it, like we just said. And knowledge is power. Yeah. And that's the greatest tool that the enemy is using against his people right now, mm -hmm. is knowledge and truth. That's right. He's got the whole world fooled. So. Yeah. yeah, and that, that's part of the deception that's going to come in the end days. All mm -hmm. People are going to think this isn't a big deal, and it is a very big deal. Now, um, that's why it matters. So in a, in a nutshell, <laughs> speaking of things that matter tonight, Nehemia Gordon joins Michael Rood for the Karaite Files. Uh, this is week three in the series of eight special teachings called the Karaite Files because Nehemia is a Karaite Jew. Um, you can watch all eight episodes here on Shabbat Night Live for the next several weeks. We will break for Yom Teruah next week and come back. Uh, and if you watch the Karaite Files tonight and you like what you see, you can pre-order a DVD of the whole thing on DVD or Blu-ray. Uh, it won't be available until November, but you can pre-order it now. We'll send it to you after the last episode airs. And uh, the Karaite Files will be, like we said, eight episodes, eight discs. And uh, if you pre-order now, you can save 20% and uh, get it on sale. $43.95, I believe, is what it comes out to. And up next, it's Q&A with Michael Rood and Hemia Gordon, followed by the third episode of The Karaite File. So stay with us. How much does the understanding of the culture and times of the Bible matter to us today? Or for our understanding of prophecy in the future? Learn how to properly interpret biblical culture and times and get a glimpse into the prophetic fulfillment of the fall feasts in Michael Rood's new teaching, The Day of Trumpets. This is Yeshua's teaching in the Capernaum Synagogue. And it is on the last day and the resurrection. He will be the one that raises us. The Day of Trumpets is part of Michael Rood's 20 episode Love Gift Teaching Series. Own the Day of Trumpets today for a donation of $50 or more. Or donate $100 or more to get the Day of Trumpets plus a beautiful ram's horn shofar. Hurry, supplies are limited. Call now or visit us online to receive the Day of Trumpets, Episode 9 of Michael Rood's 20-episode Love Gift Teaching Series. Back here with Nehemia Gordon answering questions from cyberspace. This comes from Tommy Teague. Amazing video, amazing teachings. God bless your brother. Thank you for everything. But <laughs> I love the butts. There's always a but. <laughs> I just want to say I beg to differ on the point about the locusts being grasshoppers. I do know that grasshoppers are kosher because the Yemeni Jews have always eaten them. Uh, I would uh, I would beg to differ there. It's the grasshoppers are not kosher because they have always eaten them. They're kosher because the scripture says that you can eat them. Okay, but I would argue that locust and honey were indeed the locust bean, uh, which is carob, uh, which I have growing in my yard in Israel, and this combined with honey would provide more nourishment. So the first thing I was uh, ask you is, uh, have you analyzed this? Do we have a label that says uh, what the nutritional content is of your, uh, your carob and your honey? And do you have a likewise packaged uh, and analyzed, uh, uh, actually locust as the scripture refers to locust? But um, uh, this, uh, of course, we're gonna read, and John was, I'm going to read out of uh, Mark here. Uh, we also have this in, in uh, Matthew and Luke. And John was clothed with camel hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locust and wild honey. Now, the, the word locust right here is uh, in Greek, it is a, a crease in, in Greek, a crease. And this is what we do we simply go to a, a crease in the, uh, in the Septuagint, and we look it up in the Septuagint, and we see literally, literally, you know, there's gotta be uh, 50, 75 usages of this, and it all goes back, and Nehemi, I'm gonna have you take it from there because you're well, gonna take it right back to I, the beginning. Yeah, my, my first question is, why on earth would you connect the charuv, the carob, with the locust animal? In English, it might be called locust beam, but in Hebrew, it's nothing to do with locust. 
I mean, that that's, <laughs> doesn't even make sense. Right. It's um, only called Hebrew, locust bean gum on Breyer's ice cream. Well, it's called charuv in Hebrew, which is the Eng English gets that word from Hebrew. Carob is charuv. But that has nothing to do with the locust. It's it's completely different word. The word for locust is arbe, and that word appears in. Uh, let me read the passage here, Michael. It's Leviticus 11. And, uh, and this is to the 22. same. Back in the Septuagint, this is a oh, priest. Absolutely. It's but, the but, same word. But let's get the context. Leviticus okay. 11 says, "But among the winged insects that walk on all fours, you may eat those that have jointed legs above their feet, with which to leap upon the ground." And then it explains, it gives examples of that in case you didn't know what we're talking about, because that sounds a little complicated. Mm -hmm. It says, of them you may eat. And then in Hebrew, it lists four kinds. Arbe, salam, and these are translated into English, but those are guesses. The Hebrew is arbe, salam, chargol, and chagav. So whatever those are, they are uh, animals that have, literally, it says the or, back or legs. Insects. Insects, insects in right. Well, uh, insects that have the back legs above their legs with which to hop upon the ground. So we're describing what we would call in English crickets and locusts and Grass grasshoppers. Hopping. And the word in Hebrew here, the first of the four types of, of um, bugs is arbe. Arbe is the same word that appears in the plague of locusts. Mm -hmm. There's no question that arbe is what we call locust in English. They come in plagues. And then in Hebrew, or sorry, in Greek, when the Greek translates this in Leviticus 11.22 from the Hebrew arbe, the translation is, as you said, the same word akris. It's the same word that of what John ate. So why on earth would you then say, oh no, this is not locust arbe akris. It's locust bean because in English you call it locust bean. That's just, to me, I, I don't understand that. that. That's not how to read the Hebrew language and not even how to read the Greek language. What you need to do is look at the Hebrew, see how it's used in different places. And the fact that this is the same thing as the plague, and it tells me that this is very clearly what we would call a locust. No question about it whatsoever. Okay, and, I've, right. and I've had grasshoppers and they're quite delicious. Oh, I have too. I, I, have, I, I tell people yeah. how to cook them, so dip them in honey. They're, they're wonderful. Yeah. So. I was in China and I was in this street and the whole street was covered with different types of bugs they were selling on skewers and in bowls. And I'm like, oh, disgusting, until I saw the locusts uh, or the grasshoppers, and I said, oh, I'll, I'll get a bowl of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And they yeah. were delicious, yeah. yeah. So. There, there you go. Mm -hmm. Well, you've had some questions that come up. Uh, yeah, so here's one, um, and this is a really good one. Josh Brown wrote, in your view, are there definite categories of the people of Israel versus the strangers among them versus foreigners who know God versus all the other foreigners? Are there different expectations to these groups? In other words, if you're born a Jew or from the from the, 12 tribes of Israel, is there one commandment, set of commandments for you, and a different Torah for the stranger, for the one who's not born from Israel? And um, I think what this uh, gentleman is getting at, um, and if he's not, this is asked a lot, is about the seven Noahide laws, which is what the rabbis teach. They teach that the Jews are under one set of commandments in the Torah. Uh, they describe it as 613 commandments, a number that's completely made up that's not in the Torah anywhere. They say the Jews have 613 commandments and the Gentiles only have seven commandments. Where can these seven commandments be found? <laughs> of course, they're not in the Torah. They're in the Talmud and in the Midrash. They're in the oral mm -hmm. law. Um, and I've actually asked this to Chabad rabbis who are going around teaching Gentiles to keep the seven Noahide laws. I, and I said to them, so how could these Gentiles know these seven laws? And why don't they know about these seven laws anywhere in the world except for in the Talmud and the Midrash? Why don't the Gentiles know these laws if, they're all, if they were given to Noah? Noah has descendants. Those descendants remember about the flood all over the world. You have flood stories in, in, in the, among the Maya, among, you know, you name it all over the world, but they don't know about the seven Noahide laws. That only comes from the oral law. And the way I read the Torah is there's one Torah for the native born and the sojourner. That, that, that's the whole point. That's what, yeah, Isaiah, that's that's what that's Isaiah 56 it. is about. Mm -hmm. He says, let not the son of the Gentile who joins himself to Yehovah say, Yehovah has surely separated me from his people. You must not say that. Now, it's very interesting, Michael. I was recently speaking in a synagogue on, uh, on Shavuot, and there was this young girl in the audience. She had just gone through bat mitzvah. She was uh, around 12 years old. And she raised her hand during the Q&A, and she said, you know, I, I, I know you do this interfaith dialogue thing with, with non-Jews, um, and, and I've heard about these Christians who keep the Torah. Do you know anything about these people? I was shocked. I'm like, this, is, this isn't a messianic synagogue. This is a, a real this synagogue. This is a real synagogue. This is a conservative synagogue. And I asked her, where do you know about that from? And she said, in her Jewish school, they taught her about this. In the Jewish school, they taught her. They said, you guys need to be aware. There's this thing called Jews for Jesus, which is basically a scam to trick Jews into believing in Jesus. This is what they're teaching her in the school. And right. they said, but mm -hmm. there's this other thing that's completely different, which are these 
They call them Christians. There are these Christians who live by the Torah and they're not trying to change us or convince us of everything, of anything. They're just trying to live by the Torah. And she wanted to know more about it. She learned wow. about it in school. Wow. And I actually asked her, I said, so is your teacher a Jewish? And she said, oh yeah, my teacher is a conservative Jew, you know, no, no different than um, anybody else. Um, so thought, this is something that's becoming such a, uh, such an issue yeah. that they're actually being taught this in grade oh, school, in, in a Jewish school. They're encountering people out in the world who are keeping Torah, who they see in the supermarket with the zit zits, as my friend Keith calls them, with the tzitzit, and they're saying, well, wait a minute, who, who, what are you guys? Who, who, are you Jewish? No, I'm not Jewish. I'm, uh, you know, and so they're, they're, they're explaining it the best they know how. Mm -hmm. In other words, her teacher clearly doesn't have all the information, but, um, but I think it's interesting that, that this is, you know, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, when I first met a man who described himself as a Messianic Gentile, that was unheard of. Nobody, you know, I, I used to uh, bring these people over to a Friday night dinner at my mother's house. And these were people who believed in Yeshua and kept the Torah. And she would refer to these people as my Christian friends. And I'd try to tell her, no, mom, they, they don't consider themselves Christians. And she'd say, do they believe in Jesus? And I'd say, well, they... They call them Yeshua, then they're Christians, they're Catholics. In, in her mind, that's what it was. And now we've gotten to the point from my mother's generation, anybody who has anything to do with the New Testament is a Christian and really a Catholic, to now they're being taught in, in these Jewish schools that, hey, there are these non-Jews out there who wanna keep the Torah and live by the Torah. And um, they're still calling them Christians, but they're but they're <laughs> they're getting more of an understanding. This is a growing phenomenon, Michael. I've met people like this all over the world. God's doing something with these people. Yeah. This and is it's incredible. Just completely out of the blue. I mean, you're meeting them uh, in the uh, you know the, the the roughest places of South Africa uh, oh, yeah. who have revelations, and and then you're sent in there Beijing, to decode China, this. The woman says to me, "I had a dream, and God appeared to me in the dream and told me I need to keep the Torah." In Beijing, China, the woman doesn't speak a word of English. We're speaking through an interpreter. I mean, this is a God thing. This is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It really is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're seeing it. You know, and this is what uh, uh, Yeshua said, that the world may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And when we live according to his Torah, and when Gentiles live according to the Torah, it actually provokes the Jews to jealousy because most of them don't live according to the Torah. They live according to what they inherited from their forefathers, which is rabbinic Judaism. And uh, the rabbis teach that in order for the Gentiles to have a part in the world to come, they must proclaim that the seven Noahide laws came from Moses. They, that is the confession of faith. That is the hakifadi, if you please, in Arabic, the utter nonsense that they have come up with that, uh, that uh, this is how Gentiles get to enter the world to come is by confessing before a rabbinic court that the seven Noahide laws came from Moses, which they didn't. So I guess I am out of luck for the world to come. This is Michael Rude signing off with the Henry Gordon. Right after this message, we'll be back with Shabbat High Live. Michael Rood's Message of Truth is broadcast all over the world, but none of it happens without the monthly financial support of our Ambassador Club members. And right now, membership has more benefits than ever. I'm giving into a ministry that is helping to feed other people that have the same hunger that I do. Join now and Michael Rood will send you the Ambassador Club Welcome Kit, an exclusive messenger bag stocked with teaching DVDs, Red Sea Crossing cards, and more. You'll also receive ambassador-only bonus gifts whenever you make a separate donation to receive the monthly love gift. Best of all, you'll get ambassador-only sale prices in our online bookstore several times throughout the year. Plus, exclusive invitations to Ambassador Club functions at Arood Awakening events. All it takes is a modest commitment of $100 per month or an annual gift of $1,200. Call now or visit the Arood Awakening website to join the Ambassador Club. The traditions of modern Judaism remind us of what we did during the temple period. Not what we did, but they remind us of what we did. 
But the followers of Yeshua also have some other traditions, some other things that are reminders of what has been accomplished for us. They are reminders of what goes back long before the temple period, and it reminds us of what happened the very year that Yeshua was crucified and resurrected. At the Last Supper that Yeshua had with his disciples, the Greek scriptures tell us that he took our tone. He took leavened bread and broke it. Of course, the English, the Greek, and, and all scriptures tell us that this Last Supper was before the Feast of Passover. And the following morning, the Pharisees refused to go into Pilate's judgment hall because they didn't want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. This is not the Passover meal. And every time we serve bread and wine gives us the opportunity, as Yeshua says, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And so, as Yeshua said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. This represents my shed blood. And he spoke the prayer that the Melech Zadik shared with Abraham thousands of years ago. Baruch Kata Yahovah Elohim Melech Olam Borei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yahovah our Elohim, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua took bread, and he blessed the Most High, saying, Baruch Kata Yahovah Elohim Melech Olam Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Blessed are you, Yahovah our Elohim, King of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth. As often as you do this, we do this in remembrance of him. L'chaim. Thank you for watching our broadcast. If you are enjoying this, click the subscribe button below this video. By subscribing to our channel, you will receive immediate updates on new videos we post in the future. Now, back to the teaching. Have a blessed time. privilege to welcome as a guest on our Shabbat Night Live broadcast, uh, the Hebrew scholar that I became aware of uh, uh, actually in the uh, last millennium, and uh, that uh, before the, the turn of the century. Uh, I got to know him because I was introduced to him uh, by the head of the Israeli New Moon Society, which is a group of ortho ultra-Orthodox scholars that are set to uh, put in place all the details so that the ancient biblical calendar can be restored when the Messiah comes, and that is their intent. Knowing that in 359 of the Common Era, that is when Rabbi Hillel II and the Sanhedrin in their last act uh, made Takanot, admitted they are making Takanot, and that they are changing the biblical calendar to a calculated calendar, and they said that the, we are going to keep that calendar, the calculated calendar, while we're in exile and continue until the Messiah comes. Well, it was at that uh, first meeting that I was invited uh, uh, to, uh, as part of the Israeli New Moon Society, uh, that they had me contact Nehemiah Gordon. They said, this one piece of information has got to be known, and for my astronomically corrected calendar uh, to be absolutely correct and to be the calendar that they used in the temple period, that there's another part that had to be added, and that is what I found out the next day when meeting Nehemiah Gordon, who is with us all the way from Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah, good to have you back again. Hello, Michael. It's great to be back here. Well, uh, Nehemiah, that, uh, that next day after the uh, conclusion of the Israeli New Moon Society, we mm -hmm. met together and uh, it was down at coffee time, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, uh, you know, a block from Ben Yehuda Street mm -hmm. right downtown, yeah. and that is when I got to understand a little bit about what a Karaite is. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. 
and uh, that was uh, that was a, a revelation to me because I did not mm -hmm. realize that there were Jews who did not accept the authority of the rabbis to mm -hmm. add their own commandments, and that mm -hmm. they went by the scriptures. And that's uh, that's when I had a rude awakening. <laughs> <laughs> me too, when I met you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and really, our first conversation. I know from your perspective, the main issue really was this Aviv calendar which I had been working on at that point for um, you know, quite a number of years. And, mm -hmm. and even before I got involved, like, like, you know, we were over a decade into it at that point. That's right. And yeah. um, you know, it, really, it really starts out with Deuteronomy 16, verse 1, where it says, Shamorat Chodesh Aviv, observe or keep the month of the Aviv. And so what does that mean? And I remember when I was in high school, I was sitting in my bedroom and I had this concordance, which is this book entirely in Hebrew, um, you know, there's a Strong's Concordance. Mine was a Hebrew Concordance, Mandelkorn's Concordance. Every single word in Hebrew arranged according to root. And I opened it up and I looked, okay, observe the month of the Aviv. What's Aviv? And I looked it up and I saw, okay, this word appears a number of times in the Tanakh. Now I have it on my computer, Michael. Ah. On, my, on my computer, I see it appears seven times in the Tanakh. And I've got, uh, for example, um, Exodus 23, 15. Uh, observe the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, etc., um, uh, as I have commanded you at the time of the month of the Aviv, for in it you went out of Egypt. And then a similar thing in Exodus 34, 18, when they actually leave Egypt, in Exodus 13, 4, today you were going out in the month of the Aviv. So, so you're saying the Aviv, not the yeah. month of Aviv, That's, as well, your King James absolute, says. Well, I, I hadn't read the King James <laughs> right. at that point okay. in my life. Okay. Um, right. I just knew what it said in the Hebrew, Chodesh Ha Aviv. Ha is the, Chodesh is mm -hmm. month or new moon. So this is the new moon of the Aviv is literally what it says. Mm -hmm. um, Chodesh means both month and new moon. So what was this new moon of the Aviv? I, I, I didn't know. And as I was searching in this concordance, I find Exodus 9, 31 to 32, and there it says, nukata, the flax and the barley were smitten, ki aviv pishta givol, for the barley was aviv and the flax was givol, whatever that means. Um, and it says the next verse, kusemet lo nuku ki afilot tema, and the wheat and the spelt were not smitten for they were dark. And this is describing the plague of hail in Egypt. Right. Certain mm -hmm. crops were destroyed by the hail, other crops were not destroyed, and the one that was destroyed was the barley because it was aviv, and the wheat wasn't destroyed because it was dark. What did that mean? That still didn't answer my question entirely, and, and it was really an agricultural question. Um, after high school, I ended up spending a year on a kibbutz, and um, this was actually very common back then. And I was a volunteer on a, on a kibbutz, which is like a commune in Israel, and... Um, and and they put me to work in, in this air-conditioned factory. And I had a really cushy 9-to-5, comfortable job. This was in the Beit Shan Valley, which is very hot. Mm. Um, it's like mm -hmm. hotter than Texas. And I'm in an air-conditioned factory. And after three days in the factory, I said, I didn't come to Israel to sit in the factory with air conditioning. I came to get my hands in the soil of the field. And I really had I'd understood a, this Aviv issue, but I wasn't thinking about that. What I was thinking is, as I read in the Torah... I would see all these commandments related to agriculture, and I realized that the ancient Israelites, they were people of the dirt, people of the soil, mm -hmm. and I wanted to live that way in the land of Israel, in the land of my ancestors. And coming from Chicago, your father being a lawyer, you were yeah. not uh, quite the, the dirt uh, farmer. You didn't well, live on a farm like I was no, in Michigan. I grew up in the city. I've been a city slicker my whole life, except for the one year I lived on the kibbutz. <laughs> and my father was a rabbi and lawyer by profession, and no, I, I, was, I was groomed from the time I was, look, my grandfather was uh, the first Jew to ever work for Standard Oil. He had a doctorate in chemical engineering. And uh, both my parents had master's degrees. I was groomed from the time I, I first knew that I was gonna be, go into the university world. That was, there was no question whatsoever. And in high school, I rebelled, and, and I made my declaration that my goal in life was to be a dirt farmer. <laughs> oh, that what more of a, like a yeah. lead balloon, I'm sure. And I, I actually started out in my backyard <laughs> in Chicago growing. First, I actually tried to go ri grow rice. It was not successful. And then I grew corn. Little did I didn't realize that I was in the, the, you know, the greatest corn-growing region of the world. Um, I knew there was a lot of corn in Indiana, but I, I, I didn't realize. Um, I grew some beautiful corn. I moved to Israel, and, I, and I'm growing wheat. 
And as I'm growing the wheat, among a bunch of other crops, spelt, and our, not spelt, sorry, alfalfa and a um, bunch of other things. And uh, we're growing this wheat, and I start to understand what this Aviv is. And I'd read about it, but it sounded all very hypothetical. You know, there's mm -hmm. a certain stage where the crop will be destroyed and another stage where it won't be destroyed. I, how would, like, what does that even, what does that look like? Um, so as I was growing these crops in these fields, and I we would we would hit the fields at 5 a.m. and work until it was too hot to work. Um, so it was very different. So they you understand yeah. why they, they wanted to put the uh, the the American in the in the air conditioned factory. They didn't think I could handle the fields. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was out there in the fields, and it was an amazing education, which helped me later on with with understanding the Aviv because I got to experience what it means to grow crops in the land of Israel. You know, and there's this great verse in Deuteronomy, it says, the land of Israel is not like the land of Egypt. In the land of Egypt, you have a steady supply of water year round. In Israel, you're dependent on rain. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't rain, your crops fail and you die. And I got to experience, I didn't, you know, didn't have crop, crops failing and dying, but being in Israel, you get to experience some of the cycles, the agricultural cycles of Israel and weather cycles with the rain and the dryness and the drought that you, you wouldn't understand, you know, sitting, yeah. sitting in Chicago where it rains year round. It, when it's not raining, it's snowing. Right, Israel's right. a completely different sort of situation. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I live up in the Galilee and, you know, like mm. right after Passover, there is no rain. There's not a drop of rain mm. until the end of Sukkot. You know, six yeah. months later, there's not a drop of rain that falls. And so what the whole point it's telling us is that we are dependent on the creator of the universe. Well, you know, if you've got the Nile flowing with water year round, you never have to worry about where the water's come from, coming mm -hmm. from. If you're dependent on rain, you better get praying because it's up to the creator to provide rain for you. And, um, and it tells us in, in scripture, in the Tanakh, that this is the message that he's trying to give us, that we are dependent on him. And he says his eyes are upon the land of Israel all throughout the year. God is paying attention to Israel and these mm -hmm. agricultural cycles are, are, are key to understanding that. And, and, and I think there's actually a really, there's something here for the modern mind is really scary because the, mo our modern way of thinking is we want to control everything. We want everything planned out and controlled and computerized and scheduled. And, uh, and here you have a situation where, uh, not only do we not know when, when these feasts are going to fall out, if they're based on these agricultural cycles, we don't know when they're going to fall out in advance by years. We n might be days before the beginning of the Hebrew year. We might be hours before the beginning of the Hebrew year and not know, is tonight at sunset going to be the beginning of the Hebrew year? Or is it going to be tomorrow night or next month? And, and that's yeah. really challenging for the modern way of thinking. You know, we have to schedule years in advance when we're going to do things. It's just our yeah. way of thinking and, 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 and doing things. And, and we had this very situation happen this year. Yeah. Uh, we were both, uh, you know, the in early March, we were both mm -hmm. in the United States. I yeah. talked to you just before you went over to Israel. Yeah. I had to schedule when we're doing Passover. Yeah. I had to schedule last year. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we ran out of room in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, really? we, the the yeah. ballroom, the only thing big enough for our Passover celebration mm -hmm. is uh, like uh, 20 miles north of here. Mm -hmm. uh, big convention center. Oh, wow. So I had to get it a whole year in advance. So I had to schedule at the earliest possible time that we would expect the barley mm -hmm. to be Aviv yeah. uh, for, for uh, to do our Passover yeah. celebration. And so we mm -hmm. looked like everything was uh, everything was going to happen this year. Yeah. You were expecting it. Would yeah. been, you know, actually, I think you said you'd be surprised, but but uh, we've been surprised before. Well, you know, and, and, we, we've we've made our guesses every year, yeah. haven't we? Well, but I was really surprised this year, and I guess the Creator wanted everybody to know that uh, He's in charge, <laughs> and it's no That's human beautiful. being who will ever make the call. It's always going to be Him. No one knows the day or the hour when it's going to take place. We just can't predict it in advance, you know. And it was funny because I thought we'd find the Aviv barley, and we'd go out there, and, it, and it's not Aviv yet, you know. I'm, and, I, and I keep saying to people, and this, this is, you know, decades of experience. Yeah, here with the yeah. people, the farmers in the land of Israel, yeah. the people that speak the language that are there year round. It's not just somebody that gets on a plane, flies over yeah. there for three days, and and you yeah. know decides they're going to determine what Aviv is. Oh, and and I do these follow ups where I look at the barley uh, before the Aviv, during the Aviv search, after the Aviv search. I'm I'm doing these constant mm -hmm. tracking as it's uh, developing. That's actually important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Um, um, so I was surprised the first time that we that it wasn't Aviv, 
And number two, I then said, well, okay, since it's not Aviv, I know when, when the actual new year will be. It'll be when the moon will be visible. That's right. Unless there's clouds. Like, but that's not going to happen. That could happen in the fall, but in the spring, that'll never right, happen. Right, right. And then we yeah. have a dust storm that covers all of Israel. And, and, and I'm really convinced that God just wanted the whole world to know that he's in charge. Yeah. And so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we were down the Dead Sea Valley that night. Man, did we have a storm that night. And it was funny. I woke up that morning. It was perfectly clear skies. And in the afternoon, I get a, an email from a friend who says, you know, I'm up in the north and it's, there's clouds all over. I'm like, what? I go outside and I look. I'm like, no, it's still clear here in Jerusalem. An hour later, you know, you couldn't even see the sun anymore because, because the clouds were so thick mm -hmm. uh, or the, yeah. the, the haze. And so we ended up not setting the new moon, even though it should have been easily visible. And, yeah. and the bottom line here is, you know, you really can't predict these things. It's up to the creator of the universe to, um, you know, the, he's, he hardwired this in crea into creation. It's Genesis chapter one, verse 14. It talks about how he made the sun and the moon for, um, for his appointed times, his, you know, days and his years and his appointed times. Mm -hmm. And then we have the verse in, uh, in the Psalms. It says, he created the moon for the appointed times. So we look up at the heaven and we see the moon and we know that that is when the moon begins. But what do you do if there's clouds? Well, then it's the next day. And we actually see this in the story of um, David and Jonathan, that they're able to know. He says to him, tomorrow is the new moon. So he knew in advance that the next day would be the new moon. I've had some people contact me who say, well, this proves that he had the calculations of Hillel too from 359 <laughs> AD. And I'm like, what? We know that we know where those, those calculations- Those are Arab astronomers Actually, they, Babylon. they go back from the, to, they're, they're really traced back to Ptolemy, who was a Greek astronomer, and he's using Babylonian data to figure out when the moon uh, will be in a state of conjunction. And they use his exact formulas and exact calculations of Ptolemy, um, this Greek astronomer using the Babylonian data. But uh, so certainly King David didn't know about this. And a much simpler explanation is that they hadn't sighted the new moon at, after the 29th day going into the 30th. So by default, it's the next night. I mean, it's, it's just as simple as it could possibly mm -hmm. be. Yeah. And then they make the appointment. They yeah. say, okay, tomorrow's the new moon and we'll meet then. Um, so we have this biblical calendar. What I love about this is it's not really a matter of dispute in the Jewish world. The rabbis agree that this is the calendar up until 359. They mm -hmm. agree it's the calendar that will be in the end times. The only point of, of, of conflict, of disagreement, is what do we do now while we're waiting for the Messiah to come and, and as the rabbis would say, the Sanhedrin to be reestablished. And I say, let's do the best we can now with what we have. The rabbis say, we don't have the authority to do that. We have to follow the tradition of Hillel II. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, now with that uh, postponement of one day, that moved uh, the, the Passover in, mm -hmm. uh, in the days of antiquity when the mm -hmm. temple stood, yeah. uh, that would have moved it from a Friday mm -hmm. uh, to a Shabbat. Yeah. And uh, now we're going to get into this. Let's, let's do a time of, of yeah. Q&A yeah. because you're mm -hmm. maintaining that uh, Shavuot didn't mm -hmm. change because of that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that it did. And so what yeah. I would like to do, uh, not right now because okay. we've got other, other uh, fish to fry, Wonderful. Uh, but for us to, to talk about that because I I want people to understand that uh, yeah. we don't agree on everything. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, I found that you've been right and I've had to change. I found I, sometimes I, that I've been wrong and I don't even agree with, I'll have people say, it says on your website, I'm like, I don't agree with that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I actually for, have stuff on my website I put up in 1998. Um, and I'll share, in, in, you know, in, in a later episode about my time as a high school teacher in China. But, I, but one of the really striking things to me is I had this little girl, a student, she was 16 years old and it was her birthday and I realized I have stuff on the internet older than this girl. <laughs> and I went back and looked at some of that stuff and said, oh, wow, I understand why I wrote that back then, but I actually don't even agree with all that stuff. And I think, and I think that's a blessing that I've been able to mm -hmm. grow oh, and yeah. continue in my walk instead of being static. You know, there are a lot of people. Yeah, and just continue to defend yeah. your former position regardless we, we, of the we, evidence. We've laid our claim on this hill. Now we're going to die here. No, mm -hmm. I want to be. I don't want to be stuck on a hill entrenched. I want to be walking on a journey of faith, mm -hmm. and looking back at the stuff that I don't even agree with that I wrote, tells me, okay, so I, you know, I've been faithful to the Creator, and He's been faithful to me to allow me to continue to grow and, and progress. Mm -hmm. So. Well, this, this is uh, uh, your, your work on the Aviv, and uh, you know, year after year, bringing people, assembling the Aviv search mm -hmm. team. 
Um, and this, uh, again, goes back to Egypt. It says that uh, from mm-hmm. now on, mm-hmm. we're actually given the instruction before we ever leave Egypt that when we enter the land, that we'll keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread at in the month of the Aviv, mm-hmm. and to uh, guard Shemar the, the, the month of the Aviv. Well, we're commanded to keep the, uh, I mean, let's start off. Exodus 12, 2 is interesting because Jews consider that to be the first commandment in the Torah, Exodus 12, 2. It says, This month is for you the beginning of months. And you say, what's the commandment? So in Hebrew, the word for month also means new moon. So mm-hmm. that's taken to be a dual commandment. Number one, it commands you that the, the month begins in the new moon, and the year begins in this particular month. Now, at that point, it didn't tell us how to find out when that month was. Moses knew and taught the people. He's like, okay, now do this thing. But it isn't until um, Exodus 23 and then 34, then, they, then we're told twice, we're told to do this in Chodesh Aviv, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm-hmm. So we're then told um, for the future, this is how it's done. And then in Deuteronomy 16, that's reiterated, Shemot Chodesh Aviv. We get a little bit more information about what Aviv is from Leviticus 2.14, which is talking about these uh, offerings, these grain offerings, and it talks about Aviv parched in fire. Okay. That, and from there we find out, okay, mm-hmm. Aviv isn't ripe grain. It's sl- slightly less than ripe grain. Now this is important because Early on, I would, uh, was out doing this Aviv stuff, and I didn't really know what it said in the English Bible. I, I was reading the Bible in Hebrew, mm-hmm. and I had people who wrote to me, and they, and they said, they said are, is it green ears yet? And I'm like, green, green, ear, green ears? What's, what are the green ears? I, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and I guess it turns out that in the English, Aviv is translated as green as ears. Green so ears. If it has anything, it's so, not green ears. Well, and, and it's not a terrible translation except it would have been more accurate to describe them as still green ears. The way some people have taken them in modern times But, but is in Hebrew, it's actually... Aviv. Aviv. Aviv, yeah, right. There's no question. Um, right, it's very clear. Um, the point is that there are people in, in English speakers who are using their Strong's Concordance who came to the conclusion that, oh, as, uh, the minute the ears are green, the, the, the minute you have ears, essentially, of grain, those ears are green, and that is when you begin the month of the Aviv, but actually the way it's described in, e- in Hebrew in Leviticus 2.14 is they can be parched in fire. So these ears are full of grain, mm-hmm. grain that when you parch it in fire, it doesn't evaporate. It's mostly solid material. Mm-hmm. So, and look, some of this is very technical stuff. This is stuff that I, that I learned and others learned after going out into these fields, handling the grain and consulting experts and doing experiments of actually gathering grain, parching it in fire. Mm-hmm. It's the simplest yeah. way to do it. Right. Parch the grain in fire and we see, oh, there's nothing in those green ears. They, it all evaporates because it's all moisture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and you do yeah. this in the, uh, uh, the, the half hour program we did together, uh, the Creator's Time Clock in Israel. Yeah. You actually go through these different things yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that would indicate yeah. uh, uh, Aviv yeah. In, uh, such as the grain yeah. uh, being destroyed because yeah. it was struck by hail. Right, right. So it's, it, it still has its, you know, it's still brittle. Um, when the grain is younger, when it's dark, the way it describes it in Exodus 9, 31 like and 32. Like the wheat, yeah, the wheat the was wheat dark. The wheat was dark, which meant that it was still in, in a, a much more um, flexible uh, state. As the, the grain starts out as a deep green in mm-hmm. Israel, I've actually seen varieties that are deep blue, but a, a deep green or greenish blue, and then it becomes light yellow over time. So that dark stage is it's young enough where the hail won't damage it. And then mm-hmm. later when it's aviv, the hail will destroy it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, so these are agriculture. Here's the point. These are agricultural terms, which every ancient Israelite understood. Yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was everyday it, life. Well, I mean, it'd be like saying to somebody, uh, you know, I was tweeting, uh, you know, when I, I tweeted LOL. Well, what does that mean? Imagine a thousand years from now, somebody digs up and they find the phrase, I tweeted LOL. What does it mean? And then you discover there was this thing called Twitter and LOL was laughing out loud, um, you know, but you, but then you would have a faction that says, LOL isn't laughing out loud. It's lots of love. And I've actually heard that from some people who didn't know English. Um, and I'm like, no. <laughs> so the point is, these were things every ancient Israelite understood with the language, with their mother's milk. Mm-hmm. They were learning the Hebrew language and they understood the meaning of these words. So today we have a double challenge uh, in this society. Number one is 
we, the Hebrew language has been resurrected by Ben Yehuda in the 1880s, but that's modern Hebrew. It's a little bit different than biblical Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, the word Aviv doesn't mean uh, ripening barley in modern Hebrew, it means spring. Right. And I've had this conversation with Israelis, they'll tell me there's flowers and therefore it's Aviv. No, look in the ancient Jewish sources. Before the 1400s, this is great uh, resource, Ben Yehuda wrote a dictionary. He went through every period of Hebrew and documented what each word meant. It's unbelievable what he did. He did it without computers. He did it with index cards. It's unbelievable. And he showed that the word of Eve doesn't take on the meaning of spring until the 1400s. Uh, a Barbanel is the first one to use it that way. Every Jewish writing before then used Aviv in the agricultural sense of ripening barley. Mm -hmm. So that's number so one. So really, technically, yeah. uh, uh, it is defining the maturity of the barley. Absolutely. And even we have the name Tel Aviv which is a place first mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. Now there's a modern city called Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. but that was named after uh, the place in Babylon in Ezekiel. And it was a mound of ripening barley, apparently, is what Tel Aviv meant. Tel, tel is a mound. Um, so you have, uh, number one is the Hebrew language has changed, and for most people it's been lost. But even for Hebrew speakers, it's changed over time. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back and look at these resources to find out what it originally meant. And number two is, to be honest, most of us aren't farmers these days. And as a result, we've got a, and even if we're farmers, even people, I've spoken to people who grew up as farmers and they've, you know, ran the combine when they were eight years old. And, but we're dealing with a different situation. These were dirt That's farmers fine. who harvested mm -hmm. by hand. When you're harvesting by hand, you want the grain to be a different level of ripeness than if you're harvesting with the combine. That, that's this is right. all it, stuff we had to learn over years. Yeah, with, with the combine, you want it completely ripe, Bone completely dry. dried out. Yeah. But if you were to harvest that with a sickle, oh, it would shatter. It, yeah, you'd shatter yeah. the stalk, the head. Yeah. You'd just reseed for the next year. You right. wouldn't get anything in, right, into the right. threshing floor. So the point is that that we we have to bridge this language gap, and we have to bridge this cultural. Um, historical technological gap, and we can mm -hmm. do both of those, but it's not just opening up the strongest concordance and saying, okay, this is what it is. It's, it's more than that. Right, right. So, and so that's the, yeah. the problem. We've got English speakers looking at uh, English Bibles and then, mm -hmm. you know, strong concordance, which is a, a very elementary concordance. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just the simplest of concordances. It helps you find words. Well, so, so here's really an important distinction between the strongest concordance and the lexicon at the back. The Strong's Concordance is a perfectly fine resource. It's, it's not as good as a Hebrew concordance, but it's, it's a decent, decent resource to find out where a word like Aviv is used in every place. Um, the problem is people go to the back of the concordance and, and they look at the dictionary, the lexicon, which is worse than useless. I tell people take a razor and cut that lexicon out and throw it away. Use that concordance if you don't know Hebrew, but do not use that, that lexicon. It's, it was made by a guy who either didn't know Hebrew or ignored all the Hebrew that he knew when he made his, his lexicon. I don't know <laughs> what he was thinking, but it's, it's worse than, I mean, it says such ridiculous things in that concordance that don't even get me started. <laughs> Well, we're, we're going to delve into this yeah. as far as the Creator's Calendar. Mm -hmm. We're going to take just a, uh, a short break here, uh, because if we do not allow people uh, to stand with us and participate and, and give to this ministry, then we are shortchanging you out there. Now, I'm not promising you uh, that you'll have wealth and fortune if you give to this ministry. I'm not telling you to borrow money from your, from your grandmother and plant a seed and it's going to multiply a thousand times. No, it's like 10% of what, uh, what we get in this earth uh, belongs to the Almighty just for breathing His precious air on the planet. And he says to, you know, to, you know, sow that, but, uh, you know, you have the opportunity to stand with us in the min this ministry. We are doing everything we can to get the gospel of the kingdom out to you, to clarify the things in the scripture. It takes a lot of energy and resources that uh, is garnered from around the world to make this happen. And so this is the time that we give you to make your pledges, make your commitments, uh, to, to, to pray for this ministry and to stand with this because it's in your hands. You are our only sponsors. That's it. Without you, there is nothing. And the Almighty doesn't write checks and the angels don't deliver bags of gold. He leaves that for us on the earth to do his will. Don't muzzle the ox. The ox needs some feeding. We'll see you in just a couple minutes.
Aviv. His calendar was something that he put in place before we ever left Egypt. And he told us to guard it because he also knew that it would be stripped away from us if we did not guard it. And it is the understanding of the Creator's calendar that allows us to understand Yeshua's life and ministry. Because in the Gospel record, we see Yeshua going up to the feast, coming back from the feast, going up to the next feast, and these feasts can all be known exactly when they took place because the Julian calendar, put in place 42 years before Yeshua was born, and the biblical calendar can be coordinated. We know when the first slip of the new moon is. This allows us to find every detail in the gospel so that it can be put in chronological order. And that's what I got put on uh, more than 35 years ago to understand the creator's calendar. That was the problem that I was attempting to solve, and that's what put me on this course. Little did I know that it was going to be 20, 25 years later that I I would be put in the presence of Nehemi Gordon, who also had these questions in his Hebrew high school and went to the land of Israel because he also had to solve these problems because they were problems for him in the Hebrew text. And we have Nehemi Gordon with us, and we're discussing the Creator's Calendar. Uh, this is a four and a half hour video that uh, that we did uh, uh, down in a in a wadi. Yeah, uh, a lot of it in the land of Israel. The wadi Kelt, I think. The in wadi, Kelt, yeah. The wadi Kelt, and yeah. uh, and, and so and Nehemiah, let's uh, let, yeah. let's uh, let's step into the overview of the biblical calendar. Okay, yeah. so we we know that Aviv is an essential item. The the mm -hmm. month of the Aviv is what starts the year right. and what starts the month. Let's uh, step into so, that. And so it really is a very simple system and, and you know the ancient Israelites were agricultural people and they were intimately tied to the land um, and to the cycles of, of the moon and and you know it's something that we sometimes forget so you know we have lighting in our streets at night and we have electricity and which is a wonderful blessing but it also sometimes makes us you know disconnected from the cycles of nature mm -hmm. so in ancient times if you had a full moon that meant you had all night where there was free light and if there wasn't uh, a full moon then it was pitch dark and you had less time to do some of the maybe vital work you needed to do mm -hmm. um, and so people because of that they weren't tracking the moon for the purposes of you know for some kind of external purpose it was it was part of life you know, you paid very close attention to when the moon was so that you would know when you could do certain types of work. And so we have this concept called a new moon. In Hebrew, it's called a chodesh. Chodesh is from the word chadash, which means new or renewed. For example, the New Testament is translated as brit chadasha, which is the renewed covenant. So what is this renewed moon? So basically, the cycle is at the end of the lunar month, there's a period of between one and a half and three and a half days where the moon is not visible at all. It disappears. You see it for the last time in the morning just before sunrise. That's called old moon. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, wait and then you look in the evening, a uh, day and a half later, in the, you know, just after sunset, and you look to see if the, sun, if, the, if the moon is visible. And if it's not, then it's the next day. That's the basic concept. You're looking for the moon, and it's called new because the first time you're seeing it in that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It had been previously. And so this yeah. is different from the Farmer's Almanac new moon, oh, which is absolutely. a uh, conjunction so, and this, calculation. This is where people get confused. I was initially confused by this. I would look in the newspaper in Chicago, and it would say new moon. And I'd go and I'd look, and I could never see the moon. And the reason I could never see it is they were using the phrase new moon differently than the way the word, the phrase new moon, chodesh, is used in ancient Hebrew and in ancient Israel. And, and the beautiful thing is this is not a matter of dispute among Karaites and rabbinical Jews. And there's no question of what new moon means in mm. ancient Jewish sources. It's very clearly defined in ancient Hebrew sources. It talks about seeing the chodesh. The chodesh is something that's visible, that's seen. Mm -hmm. The ancient Jewish sources talk about how when the witnesses would come to testify about whether or not they saw the chodesh, the new moon, the, the court would ask them, were the horns pointing towards the sun or away from the sun? And they were talking about a crescent and mm -hmm. horns were the tips. So if they said it was facing towards the sun, they didn't actually see the moon. They saw some clouds that they thought was the moon because that's astronomically impossible. So they, right. they would ask them these basic astronomical questions that if you were lying and you might not know the answer to, 
Um, but it's very clear from what they describe in the ancient sources. There's no question whatsoever. Up until Hill II in 359 AD, they, they followed this sighted new moon calendar, sighting the young crescent new moon. Um, mm -hmm. That was to begin each month. Then to begin the year, it was the first sighted moon after the barley would be Aviv in the land of Israel. And that what they're timing here is that you have, it says, Shemor Chodesh Aviv, observe the month of the Aviv. For that month to be Chodesh Aviv, you have to go into that month with Aviv. And, and you could also translate that, Shemor Chodesh Aviv, as observe the new moon of the Aviv. To get into that month, you have to have Aviv. Mm -hmm. um, so we look and, for the and Aviv. That's uh, significant because yeah. uh, what's going to happen uh, yeah. two weeks from then? So into that month, you then have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and during the Feast of Unleavened First, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you have the Omer offering. Now, sometimes that's translated as the first fruits offering. I think we'll get into this in the, into the Q&A. Um, but that first fruits uh, offering of the, of the barley harvest is the first sheaf of the barley. That's how it describes it. The first sheaf of the barley is offered as an offering, and that then begins this whole harvesting season, which lasts months in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Remember, they're not using combines or doing it by hand. And... Um, that has to be during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, that that Omer offering is done. Right, it, exactly. Yeah. So uh, so if, if you get to the beginning of the month and you don't have Aviv and you're not going to have the Omer in the middle of the month, then you're not in the, in the, in the beginning of the year. Um, now today they call that month Nisan, but that's a Babylonian name. In the Bible it's just called Chodesh Aviv, the month of the Aviv, or Chodesh HaRishon, the first month. So what would they do in ancient times? if? The, there, if it wasn't Aviv yet, they just wait another month. And they'd have a 13-month year instead of a 12-month year. And so I've had people say to me, well, where does it say in the Bible they added a month? They didn't add a month. They were just waiting for it to be Aviv. That can be 12 months or 13 months. One of the places you actually see this uh, is in Solomon's tax system. Um, he had a, a very interesting tax system where the country was divided into 12 districts and East each district only paid taxes one month out of the year. Boy, I, I wish we had a king like Solomon today. Um, <laughs> and um, it was probably pretty heavy tax that particular month. Yeah, that's true. Because that took care of the, um, you know, the whole government for that month. Yeah, but not. here in, in modern societies, we work three or four months out of the year for the government. Right. And if right. you live in France, it's like uh, more like ten months out of the year. Anyway. Um, so we, uh, but then the government's benevolent and they give you back some of the money they stole from you. Um, anyway, so <laughs> uh, you have this situation where, um, where they would pay taxes one month, uh, one month out of the year under Solomon's tax system. And then it says in Hebrew, and there was one tax officer over the entire land. And in the English, it's mistranslated. Um, but in the Hebrew, it says, there was one tax officer over the entire land. And the ancient commentaries explain why a 13th tax officer is only 12 months. Well, that's for the 13th month. If whenever a 13th month came about, which wouldn't be every year, it'd only be every two or three years, it wouldn't be fair to impose taxes on one of the 12 districts that already paid. Mm -hmm. So they disseminated, they dispersed that tax burden over the entire country in the 13th month. So mm -hmm. they clearly had uh, a 13th month in the time of King Solomon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... So now, uh, you know, th this has been become very important. And, and to me, I, I mentioned yeah. before that, uh, you know, it was more than 35 years ago, we knew that, you know, doing the calculations that there had to be a 13th yeah. month in Yeshua's ministry, mm -hmm. you know, just, just, just because of the gospel record of what is taking place, yeah. but it couldn't be proven and, and really wasn't until you did the work in, mm -hmm. in watching mm -hmm. when the barley's aviv, when it's not aviv, mm -hmm. you know, year after year in the land of Israel. Now, right. you know, so, you know, I went into the whole calendar thing, you know, uh, close to 40 years ago, uh, to solve a problem, and that is the order of events in the in the Gospels. Mm. That that was the reason I was doing this. Okay, but you know we see of recent years, it's like like every month somebody comes up with a new calendar, <laughs> and I think the only problem they're trying to solve is how do you make a big name for yourself, uh, you know, for no reason at all, or how mm. do you get people uh, well, to you know? A lot of times it's just collecting people. Mm. Oh, you know, bring them all in. Uh, everyone has to agree with me on mm. this. And you know, mm. I see a lot of that nonsense going on. Yeah. But but what 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 do you see in this? Now we we've got yeah. those who um, 
say the the new moon is a dark moon you've well, already addressed I mean, Michael, that I don't, I don't like to question people's motives you know i i think in, in some respects i see this as not a horrible thing in the sense that it shows that there's people out there who are opening up their bibles and and i hate to say it their strongest concordance <laughs> and they're trying to figure out what is the original <laughs> biblical calendar so on the one hand they acknowledge okay the hill 2 calendar that wasn't the original calendar that's clearly something invented in 359 a.d and before that there was something different and so, so I want to give them. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're truly searching okay, and doing the best you know, they let, can. Let me say there's something else here, you know, that, that yeah. goes on. Uh -huh. If the Jews do it, it's got to be wrong. So we're going to figure it out another way. I see that a lot, man. Yeah. And there's definitely an element of that. Okay. Um, there, so as as a, long as you a, admit that there's well, something when, like that going on. When you're talking okay. about the lunar Sabbath, for example, which maybe we'll get to, I think that's the predominant factor. We'll, we'll, that, we'll jump in anytime you want to. Okay, jump but, into but I do that. want to talk about, and we'll talk more in, a, in, in a, hopefully in a future episode about Colossians 2.16. And, when, oh, we, and, we and when we get to that, I want to talk about how there's all these different calendars. I don't, I don't want to bash the people who have all these calendars, even though they're wrong. Um, <laughs> but no, but really, I, I want to give them the credit that at least they're trying, mm -hmm. because if they didn't try, then they'd just be following the Hillel 2 calendar. Um, so at least they're making an effort. Um, and, you know, and some of them in, really in innocence. I've talked to people who do things like, uh, I remember years ago, there was this guy who had a full moon calendar. And he was convinced, based on his reading of this verse in Psalms, Tikuba Chodesh Shafar, Bakesa Leom Chagenu, blow the shofar on the new moon on the Kesa for the day of her feast. He was convinced that the full moon is the new moon, which, you know, in Hebrew, it's like, there's no way you could get that. But he was convinced of this. And one of his arguments is that the full moon is just so much easier to see, and God doesn't hide the truth. It's hard to see the new moon. So I said to him, I said, and I, I wrote to him, I said, you know what? I said, let's try this calendar out. And I was completely in all sincerity saying, I'll go up onto the hilltop to observe this full moon of yours in Jerusalem. This guy was in some place in rural America. He, I said, I'll go up on the hilltop on my free time to observe this full moon, which you say is so easy to observe. What exactly am I looking for? So he explained, it's the mo first full moon to rise after sunset. So I went up to the hilltop in Jerusalem and it was not easy to sight at all. How do I know if it's risen after sunset or before sunset if there's clouds on the horizon? Right? I'm looking, I see a full moon when it's right over my head, but can I really tell the difference? By the way, I can calculate the moment of full moon. That's using computers and, and advanced calculations. Mm -hmm. If I'm observing something like ancient people did, how would I know that the full moon is going to be on Tuesday night or Wednesday night. It's not so straightforward. Well, well it, let me say, say this. Yeah. You know, the first sliver of the new moon, sometimes it's 1% illuminated. Yeah. What is 1% away from 100%? It's 99% illuminated. Okay. Can you tell the difference between 98 and 99% illumination? Because that, that full oh. moon is just a moment in time anyway. Right. And there are many months when the full moon takes place, that moment in time, when the moon isn't above the horizon in Israel. Exactly. So one night you look and it's 99%, and the next night you look and it's again 99%, because you missed it, it was dark. You know, right. it, it was, mm -hmm. it was um, or sorry, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't that time that the moon was above the horizon. So I said to him, I wanna see how to do this. So I went up to the hilltop, and I remember it was during the time when it was the second intifada, and I was on this hilltop, and I could see the muzzle flashes in Ramallah, less than 10 miles away and hear the shooting going back and forth forth uh, of the battles going on there. And I'm trying to look for the new moon as these uh, Apache helicopter gunships are going overhead. <laughs> and yeah, I'm like, this was, is surreal. I'm looking time. for the moon to, to rise <laughs> just after sunset. And it wasn't so straightforward to, to, to sight. And the point was, Here's a man who in all innocence had come up with the system which made perfect sense from, to him based on his strongest concordance and his English translations, and he had a theory of how it worked, but he'd never actually tried to put it into practice in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. And when I tried to put it into practice, um, I, I wrote back to him, I said, you know, you might be right, I don't see evidence for you being right, but you know, anything's possible, but this isn't, you can't be right because it's an easier system because it's not. It's a complicated, you know, your system is extremely complicated as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, there is an example of someone who I think really was innocent. He just came up with a theory and knew he was right. And, but when he tested it, it, it didn't work. Mm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Lunar Sabbath, you wanted to talk about that. So, so, um, man, the Lunar Sabbath is. Yeah, if you is, don't follow us, you're going to hell. Going to hell, man. <laughs> 
Well, so it's interesting. Um, this lunar Sabbath starts to show up in the 1990s. And, and I think what one of the factors that brought it about, I think, was there's um, a Jewish encyclopedia that was out of uh, copyright. And so someone had digitized it and put it on the Internet. And so these people got a hold of this uh, encyclopedia, Jewish encyclopedia from like 1901 or so, and they start to look at it. And here's what it says. Let me read you what it says. Um, I have it up here on the computer. It's JewishEncyclopedia.com. Now, what they didn't do is they didn't put the more updated Encyclopedia Judaica on the Internet because that came out in 1971, and it even now is still under copyright. So they put the outdated one. And the outdated one says about the Sabbath, it says it was probably originally connected in some manner with the cult of the moon, as indeed is suggested by the frequent mention of Sabbath and New Moon festivals in the same sentence. They took that to mean that in the original Jewish calendar, the Sabbath was based on the moon. But if you look there, it says probably, probably, okay, you tell me something's probable, what's that probability based on? Well, they explain this is a, quote, critical view. Now, in everyday daily speech, if I say critical, I mean something's really important. It's really vital. It's critical. My life depends on it. <laughs> yeah. But in scholarship, no. critical view means we're being critical of biblical tradition. Now, earlier in the same encyclopedia, they explain that according to the Bible, the new moon and the Sabbath go back to creation. And the Sabbath is actually this perpetual seven-day cycle all the way back to creation. Mm -hmm. With an unbroken, you know, this is Shabbat night live. Friday night, Shabbat, that is, if you go back in time seven days in increments of seven days, you will reach the day that God rested after six days of creation. Mm -hmm. That is the biblical view. And that is what the encyclopedia says, this very one earlier As on. the biblical the view. The biblical view. Now the critical view is, well, we yeah. don't believe the Bible. That's and what right. it's really, what it really, and it says this, you guys can read it for yourself. Um, what that means and what it ex even explains it means is, well, if we don't believe it goes back to creation, if we don't believe it goes back to God resting on the seventh day after six days of, of making the world, then it must have some other origin. And what would be that origin? Yeah, it makes the sense. origin That's is in nature. Moon. And what's in nature? If you divide a lunar month by four, you get increments of seven, not exactly, but close enough. And they said it must go back into some prehistory period which isn't recorded in ancient Israelite sources because it's prehistory. Um, th right, where, there's no evidence of it ever being. It, there's no on evidence Earth. whatsoever. And it's a great contrast to the new moon. So the new moon today is based on a calculation of Hill II from 359 AD. And it's a very fair question to say, how do you know that? Well, I can show you the Jewish sources that predate 359 AD. If I open up to you the Mishnah, which was written down in the year 210, and I show you how they're still interrogating new moon witnesses, and they tell us in the time of the temple that the priests and the, Phar and the Pharisees had two rival courts, and there were witnesses that would go and testify in both courts. And it, there it was a question of authority, but the two courts disagreeing on each other's authority didn't disagree that it was cited based on the sighting of the new moon. Now that tells you that in the first century, this is what the Jews were doing. Now show me the sources for, that date to the first century for the lunar Sabbath. They don't exist. They don't exist. All you can show me is an encyclopedia from 1901 that says probably and presents it as a critical view. Mm -hmm. And and. And really, the question I ask is, why is this so popular in the Hebrew Roots movement? Um, what, do your, what do you think of it, Michael? Why is it so popular? Give it to me straight. I think people are trying to divide up into little subcults uh, to where the, uh, their, their head rabbi, which Yeshua says, mm -hmm. call no man, uh, can fleece the flock and milk them. I don't know. I'm, I, 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 <laughs> I want to give, pe a... give people the benefit of the doubt, but I hate to say it. We, with many of the people I've spoken to, and not all the of them. The Jews say it, it's got to be wrong. There it is. I, I, that's what I've heard. Here, here's the way I've heard it presented. Right. And I have said By some of those people. Here's too. how I've heard yeah. it presented. These are people who come out of the church, and they say, we were deceived about Sunday. Sunday is the day of worshiping the sun. And then we went to Saturday and found out Saturday was the day of worshiping Saturn. And I'm like, yeah, in English. In English. <laughs> Not in Hebrew. <laughs> not in Spanish. Not in most languages. Well, that's a good, it's Sabato. It's, right, it's that's a, a good Sabbath point. in just about every language on right. the planet except English. So in Hebrew, Sunday has nothing to do with the sun. It's called Yom Rishon. 
Right. Then we have Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, Yom, we have first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and the seventh day is called Yom Shabbat. The amazing <laughs> thing about this is if you go to every Jewish community in, world, in the world, there was an Jew, ancient Jewish community in Kaifeng, China, which was cut off from the rest of the Jewish world for hundreds of years. They've got the same day of the of the week. They have the same seven day cycle. Right. Go to the Jews of no Ethiopia. No communication the around Jews the world. Of, the Jews of the Ethiopia never had the Talmud, never had an oral law, and they have the same seven day cycle. Um, every, and and the crazy thing is not crazy. The beautiful thing is go outside of Judaism, and you have the same seven day cycle. Now, the Christians don't rest on Sunday, or sorry, they don't rest on Saturday. They don't rest on Shabbat but they will tell you Sunday is the first day of the week. And right. the seventh day of the week is Saturday or in Spanish, Sabado. Go even to the Muslims who their holy day is Friday. They call it Yom al Juma, the seventh day of the week. Sorry, the sixth day of the week. They'll tell you, yeah, the seventh day of the week is Yom al Sabd. That was when the Jews rest, but we don't rest on that day. That was changed by, by their thing. Um, so they all recognize when the seventh day of the week is, they just don't rest on it. but. So the point is, this isn't just a Jewish tradition of one particular group. Every Jewish community in the world and every non-Jewish community in the world has the same seven-day cycle. Now, here's what's important. Is it possible that instead of this being Shabbat, this is really the third day of the week? That's really Tuesday? And I say anything's possible. It's possible that aliens came down to earth and put all of mankind into a deep sleep for three days. And when we woke up, we th didn't realize that it was Tuesday. It's possible. I don't, my question is, where's the evidence for that? And there is no evidence for that. And more importantly, because I mean, it's silly. Give me, give me something more realistic. Is there evidence for anyone in Jewish history who said today isn't Shabbat, today is really Tuesday? And there is no evidence for that either. Now, when we come to the yearly Sabbath, we get a completely different story. Okay, well, let me, uh, before yeah. you go to the yearly Sabbath, yeah. let me say this. Yeshua kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. He did exactly what Moses said to do. He said to do what Moses says to do. Yeah. And he kept the Sabbath with, with absolute invulnerability. Nobody, nobody touched it. Yeah. He did break the rules and regulations the Pharisees invented on that day, but he healed on the Sabbath. And there's only one place that I can show you he mm -hmm. healed on a day that wasn't the Sabbath. Hmm. Only one place. I can prove that it wasn't on the Sabbath. Oh. And so Yeshua kept the Sabbath, yeah. the same Sabbath as it is today. Yeah. There's been no change from the first right. century, absolutely. Yeah. So if he's any authority to the mm. Christian world, you know, mm. then okay, we got that nailed. Well, here's now, a really here interesting, we go. here's an interesting thing, which is a little, little it's kind of the same topic. So, and, um, and I'll, I'll try to do this real quick. So you have um, the Mishnah talking about how witnesses would come to testify that they had sighted the new moon. And it says originally they would accept all witnesses, but then they would require a character witness to come with the witness, a second witness to testify that the, guy, that the first witness sighted the new moon. And what was he testifying? It says this is because of the minim. The minim is the word in ancient Hebrew that means heretics, but it refers specifically to the Jewish followers of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And what this tells you is the Jewish followers of Yeshua were showing up at the new moon court to testify they had sighted the new moon. And the rabbis were like, look, we can accept testimony, but not from you guys, <laughs> which is very interesting. Anyone except for you. Well, and so you had to have a character witness show up with you if they didn't know you to say, well, this guy doesn't believe in Yeshua. You can trust him to testify about the new moon. But it shows you the Jewish followers of Yeshua did continue to cite the new moon and even wanted to show up to the court and have their testimony accepted, which it wasn't. But go now to the lunar Sabbath, and there's no ancient sources that testify to this. It doesn't exist before these uh, critical view people show up in the late 18, early 1900s. Um, and bear in mind, these are the same Jews who eat pork. These are the same, you know, you, you go to a, a Jewish rabbi who is of certain denominations and they may, you know, eat shellfish, um, you know, in their synagogues. So these are the guys who are talking about the critical view. Well, mm -hmm. um, so compare this to the uh, annual Sabbath. Um, that is every seven years you have a Shemitah, sabbatical year. And if you look for the ancient sources to see, because there, there is a tradition of when that takes place. Ask a rabbi and they'll tell you we know exactly when that is. But you look at that and you do find as many years as there are, there are traditions for each of those years. In fact, we have ancient tombstones which tell us 
from the 500s and even the 300s uh, AD, written in the land of Israel in, in the southern shore of the Dead Sea, and they'd state what the year is, and they correlate that to the Shemitah cycle, the sabbatical cycle, and they don't line up with a single year. They give you at least three different possibilities of when the Shemitah is. And then you go to other rabbinical sources and you find other years could be the Shemitah year. And my point is that if you look at all of Jewish literature that survived tens of thousands of pages, there's no other possibility of when the weekly Shabbat is. On the contrast with the annual Sabbath, it could be just about any year you choose. Yeah, that's right. So. And, and that's what's done now. I mean, uh, there are so many different ways that people have come up with Shemitah years. And the fact of the matter is, Shemitah refers to just the land of Israel. You enter the For land sure. of Israel. Absolutely. has nothing to do with Babylon, nothing yeah. to America. Yeah. And, you know, we've had people say, oh, the Shemitah 2009, if America doesn't keep it, millions of people are going to die. And I said, uh, away with them, you know, because it has no relevance whatsoever outside of the land of Israel, which is to rest. That's why we spent 70 years in Babylon. And the bottom line is we don't know when it is the true Shemitah. We have we have a tradition, but we also have other traditions. It could be just about any other any year there is. Whereas with the weekly Shabbat, there is no question. It's not even a matter of dispute. Well, Nehemiah, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, your your incursion over into China and some of the things that took place. I want yeah. you to come back. Come back next week. Let's go into this because I want you to take us on the journey down the road to Emmaus and all the way to China, if you would This do is going to so. be fun. I can't wait, Michael. Oh, beautiful. Hey, would you please, the ironic blessing. Besedo. Wow, I'm... I'm I'm so blessed to be here and, and have these amazing conversations, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to share with all these people this ancient blessing that you taught to the sons of Aaron that was proclaimed every day in the temple. Yevarechecha Yehovah v'yishmarecha. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'yichunecha. Yehovah shine his face upon you and be gracious towards you. Yisa Yehovah panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. Yehovah lift his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans, Shavuot Tov. Have a good week. We'll see you back here next week on the road to Emmaus with Naomi Gordon. Sai Chen. Wait, where do you think you're going? You're not done yet. You gotta subscribe if you wanna see more of this stuff. Just click the button up here. Better yet, you can click here to watch more right now. And if you like what you see, support what we do. Donate here to keep the broadcast coming. Thank you.